Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. It's the 350th episode! Really? No fanfare? Nothing? Nobody cares about hitting 350? That's like 50 more than 300! Well, in any case, 350 episodes of a comic review show is a pretty long time to go without talking about Greg Land. I've no doubt mentioned him on occasion in passing, yet have never reviewed any of his work, giving me the opportunity to yell the major problem with Greg Land and his artwork. He traces! He wholesale traces photographs and artwork. I'd say at least Rob Liefeld does his own crappy artwork, but actually Rob is guilty of tracing at times too. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, that's not too terrible in the grand scheme of things. Photographic references are common in artwork, almost necessary for many artists who have a difficult time visualizing poses and rely upon the visual in front of them. Well, that would be fine if he was just referencing photographs and poses. He's not, though. He's tracing them. And two, if he actually owned the art and photographs he was tracing. Oh no, my friends, he will trace from whatever he feels like tracing, though one of the most mocked things that he's traced from, and even admitted that he's traced from, PORN! I'd be more shocked by that, but I've said it before on this show that clearly some creators just want to make porn, so good job going that extra mile there, Greg. And even now, I bet some of you are going, well, really, what's the harm in that? Well, if you are thinking that, you're a dick! Aside from stealing the work of other people, there are creators out there who strive for a fraction of his career without resorting to theft. But you want to know what the other harm is in it? Sequential storytelling! See, the thing is, it's not just that Greg Land traces. It's that he's so lazy with his tracing. Someone who actually gave a damn about sequential storytelling would make sure that the art was consistent from panel to panel, but a lazy artist who just traces from five different sources ensures that a character won't look like the same person from panel to panel. Suddenly, a character is off-model in every shot, their hair changing its style wildly, and implying that it doesn't even matter what they look like. Which would be a searing indictment over interchangeable character types in story storytelling and the lack of well-rounded characterization, if that was the idea, but no, it's just laziness. And what's more, Greg Land has this terrible habit of reusing the same artwork over and over and over. Enjoy this little sample of the portfolio of Greg Land. So is the art the only reason we're doing today's comic? Well, not exactly. See, a lot of people have been asking me lately what I think of the Marvel event Secret Wars. I love Secret Wars! Changing allegiances, heroes fighting villains, the introduction of Spidey's black costume, the Beyonder, beneath 150 billion tons stands the Hulk. And he's not happy. One of the best and first company-wide crossovers back in 1984 to 85. Crappy and repetitive naming trends of the big two aside, yeah, I'm not reading the new Secret Wars. It didn't look interesting to me, and it was difficult enough for me to actually care about DC's own series, Convergence, which ended up being okay with some damn awesome tie-ins. I'm more of a DC than Marvel guy anyway, so really I'm just reading Deadpool's tie-in issues and waiting for the event to be over with so I can go back to reading Miss Marvel. However, one of the parts of Secret Wars that is being talked about is the death of the Ultimate Universe, which I have talked about before, particularly in Ultimates 3 and Ultimatum. Supposedly, this also heralds the end of the old Marvel Universe. <laughs> yeah, we'll see about that. At the very least, Renew Your Vows came out and confirmed that indeed, they didn't even mention the deal with Mephisto. So even if this was the new status quo for Spidey after Secret Wars is over with, they're ignoring the problem instead of addressing and solving it. So yeah, Peter Parker is still dead to me. But yeah, it seems fairly evident that the Ultimate Universe is done for, so now is a good time to take a look back at one of its miniseries. 
And a bad one at that. It takes place shortly before Ultimates 3, so I'll give any additional backstory to you as we go along. We're not doing the whole series right away, we'll be coming back to it again over time, but for the moment, let's dig into Ultimate Power number 1 and number 2. I shouldn't be looking at the covers since this is a trade, but hey, the first issue also has the trades cover, so we'll do it this time. And our first cover is just bad. This has been a real problem with all the Ultimate Universe covers we've seen so far. It's just a crowd of people shoved together. I admit that it's at least a bit more dynamic than just a bunch of people standing around doing nothing, but it ends up not having a consistent mood as a result. In this book, Susan Storm will be happy and not giving a damn about anything. In this book, Wolverine will be yelling in pain. In this comic, this guy's crotch will emit fireworks. Or it's from his hand. On the other side when his hand in the foreground is not doing that. Or maybe he's supposed to be holding his dick like a sparkler and Land just didn't get the memo. Also in this comic, Spider-Man coming out of a woman's neck. Okay, yeah, it's meant to be part of the disembodied body parts thing that everyone else has, but at least everyone else's body parts disappear because they've hit a line below them. Spidey's upper body is just floating against another woman's neck. And as I said, this clutter of people just standing around issue is bigger than just Greg Land. He's done much better and cooler cover art, even if the poses are traced. And that's really the disappointing thing about Land in general. He actually could be a great artist. He's done his own original art in the past. It's just at some point he gave up doing his own work and relied exclusively on tracing. We begin with a recap of the Ultimate Fantastic Four's deal, that instead of cosmic ray exposure from wanting to beat the commies into space, the group got their powers from a dimensional teleporter accident. And it's a good thing that Reed Richards never ever ever played around with dimensional teleporters ever again. Anyway, we truly open at a research facility in Wyoming called Project Pegasus, where a group of reptile-themed supervillainesses are all posing around, including this lady who has been drawn so that her waist is dangerously thin, and her leg placement is quite questionable, since she seems to be arcing her body despite stepping forward. Hell, at first I thought she only had one leg, but nope, she has them both! They're just condensed so that it's only behind the leg of the lady in front who is looking in the wrong direction from everyone else. Also, it's a good thing this one woman is crouching completely on the ground, and apparently also looking the wrong way, just in the complete opposite direction as the main lady. In any event, they are the Serpent Squad, and are after something that's been stolen from them. The Fantastic Four are here to deal with them. And I am so turned on right now. Johnny! I called dibs on the blonde! What is wrong with you guys? Our heroes, everyone. Hey, you got the body wrestle the half-naked Namor guy. It's our turn. <laughs> Namor assaulted her when she rejected him and threatened to level New York just to get a long kiss from her. Go to all of the hells. They fight, their leader saying that the Serpent Crown was stolen from them, and they want it back. During the battle, Ben Grimm gets hit so hard that a piece of his orange rock-like skin gets chipped off, shocking everybody. After knocking out or detaining them, they begin speculating about what the hell this could mean, especially since there's a layer of exposed muscle tissue that was underneath it. 
Tabling the scientific talk for a second, a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent comes up and explains that the Serpent Crown is an illegal energy source and the Serpent Squad are some kind of cult. They want to know more, but S.H.I.E.L.D. says that Project Pegasus is classified. Just make sure Creepy and Crawly here stay in whatever freak jail you put freaks in. Freaks? You're calling us freaks? Well, to be fair, one of your members has a spine-covered tail and green skin, your leader has scales, you have the amazing shrinking hip, and you think being a part of a snake-themed cult equals BDSM leather. Look at you! You're sickening! You're a horror! You'll die alone! Sounds like somebody is a sore loser. However, the words of a psychopathic, snake-themed, leather bondage gear wearing supervillainess really hit Ben Grimm hard. Well, probably that and the reminder that he doesn't look normal anymore after part of him literally was chipped away. Later at their lab, Reed promises Ben that he'll find some way of fixing this. Well, let's see. Took you a good 14 years to find a way to mess my life up this bad. Guess I can wait around another 14, see if you have to figure out if you can fix it. Oh, come on, Ben. He's Reed Richards. It won't even take him that long to screw it up again. After angrily standing around in front of a giant red vortex from hell, yes, I know it's a viewer into the negative zone, says so in the corner, but the thing looks like it belongs in doom. Anyway, after brooding in front of that, he smashes a chair, pissed off that he can't figure out how to cure Ben. Inspiration strikes as he looks at a tiny orb on the ground, and we cut to the Triskelion, basically S.H.I.E.L.D.'s headquarters. All I need is 22 million dollars, give or take. But Reed, 22 million seems a bit excessive for crowdfunding. Look, this new board game is going to be incredible! I know I don't even have a prototype to show off, but just trust me on this! Reed explains that he's going to build 4,200 interdimensional data retrieval constructs. The idea is that he'll send them off into as many parallel universes as possible to gather intelligence and knowledge. Considering the amount of crap that they've encountered concerning parallel universes in Ultimate Fantastic Four, including a zombie plague that a certain ghoul is going to be taking over my living room three months early to talk about, this is, in fact, a profoundly stupid idea. Probing into other dimensions is one thing. Hell, maybe a few probes, like three or four maximum. Not over 4,000 of them! And considering how parallel universes are supposed to work, what even is the good of that many? Most of them are gonna be like, universe where Reed has a different hair color, or universe where Nick Fury is played by Denzel Washington instead of Samuel L. Jackson. Speaking of, Samuel L. Fury suggests that he's trying to have them pay millions of dollars in the hopes of finding a cure for Ben Grimm. Okay, I admit that I have not read the initial Ultimate Fantastic Four comics, so maybe I'm missing something, but... What the hell good does that do him? What information would the probe supply that he didn't have access to already through the normal scans of the negative zone? Besides, at this point, it's a biological problem. Sure, greater understanding of the negative zone energies that did this might help unlock a way of reversing its effects, but then why send so many damn probes everywhere else? Yeah, he said he'd use part of them to chart the unknown regions of the zone, but still, why not all of them at the negative zone? Or is he only saying this to sell it to the military? In any event, Nick Fury turns him down. The Ultimate Universe has had too much crap happen lately, including their version of Galactus, who for some reason was not a giant dude in purple armor. Seriously, why are you even doing superhero comics if you're not going to embrace the insanity of them? The aforementioned zombie plague, an alien invasion or two, and basically just a whole bunch of crap that means people are a wee bit cautious when it comes to poking their heads around places they shouldn't be. Ultimate Carol Danvers then brings up the butterfly effect and how their actions could have unforeseen consequences if they try to do what he suggests. And then Reed rightfully points out, no freaking duh, and the butterfly effect doesn't really have anything to do with what we're talking about. In any case, Reed pleads on a personal level that he made a promise to his friend, and he needs more information. And Fury once again says no. And even I have to scratch my head. I'll admit, on a character level, I really do like Ultimate Reed Richards more than the mainstream one from what I've seen, since honestly it comes across like he actually gives a damn, and I love how much he truly loves his friends and humanity and is willing to put himself on the line to help them. 
But on the other hand, even he admits that the friggin' accident that made them the Fantastic Four yielded seven profitable patents for the United States military, and I have a hard time believing that he could do that and yet still not have enough damn information. So regardless of the universe, Reed Richards is still the smartest and yet dumbest person in the room. With no options left, Reed decides, screw it, and just builds about five of the probes by hand and sends them off through the dimensional portal. Which makes me wonder why the hell they leave that thing on for extended periods of time. Must kill the electricity bill. Or do they just really like the mood lighting it gives off? Later, we see them overseeing production on their new Fantastic Four toy line, which includes Doctor Doom and Namor. Uh, just FYI, the last we saw of Ultimate Doctor Doom, he had gone off into the Marvel Zombies universe. Again, just wait for the pale guy in the other room next month. So he's really not in any position to be yelling that his figure should be taller than Reed's. Johnny Storm complains that the toys have too many points of articulation, which confuses me. Looking at the toys, they don't look like they have that much more than any 6-inch figure. In fact, these ones are 12-inch figures, so shouldn't they really have more points of articulation? Reed enters. Johnny's right. We're looking for a more classic look for the next line. Well, in that case, shouldn't the Invisible Woman toy be rare, hard to find, and with the manufacturer insisting that girls don't like action figures? No offense, Mr. Richards. Kids today like... I'm 18 years old, sir. I was a kid yesterday. You're also not the target demographic, Reed. I've said stupid comments about toys before, and then learned to shut the hell up about it, since I didn't know what I was talking about. You should do the same. Oh, and then the roof collapses. I guess? There's a boom sound, and what I think is chunks of the roof falling down. I guess everyone was on the friggin' top floor of the place. And so our first issue ends with the arrival of... These people, traced from other artwork, including this guy pointing right at the reader. You! You're actually reading this right now? So I guess I should give some explanation here about who the hell these people are and why this is significant. Time for backstory! Before Watchmen existed... Uh, no, that, that's not what I meant. Wait. How you people have been able to follow me for 350 episodes continues to amaze me. Um, anyway, the thing is, Watchmen gets heralded as the first major story about a realistic take on superheroes, but the truth is there is another book that deserves credit. Squadron Supreme. The Squadron is a group of characters created by Marvel to be representations of the Justice League so writers could do crossovers between Marvel and DC without really having crossovers. Squadron Supreme examined the idea of what would happen if the Justice League took over the world to try to turn it into a paradise. Naturally, things go awry, as they often do, and everyone learns not to abuse their power. Well, except for the ones who die, but I think they got the gist of it anyway. Two decades later, they were rebooted into their own little Ultimate Universe equivalent in a book called Supreme Power, essentially making the same basic character backstories and giving them a gritty and modern makeover. Which essentially means everybody's a dick, but we're still supposed to like them for some reason. Okay, to be perfectly honest, I haven't actually read Supreme Power, so I don't know how accurate that joke is to the book. I'd like to think J. Michael Straczynski, who wrote the initial story, is better than that, but he's also the guy that wrote One More Day, editorial mandate or not, so nobody's perfect. But anyway, that's why the book is called Ultimate Power. It's a crossover between the Ultimate Universe and the Supreme Power Universe. And another reason why it took so long to review this thing, we've already gone through a crap ton of backstory here, and we're not even done yet. Issue 2's cover is better, but only because the burst through a page thing works for a crossover. What doesn't work is more of Land's traced artwork. Oh, and get used to characters with their mouths open inexplicably, like this woman on the left. Also, get used to Land's squinting woman face. He loves tracing that one. Hell, it was on the first issue's cover too. Oh, and on a note of laziness with that tracing, that character is supposed to have a golden necklace that he didn't bother drawing. Maybe the necklace is what kept her head and neck from drifting to the left. Anyway, we open with... a traced face of Kitty Pride, as well as a thong panty shot of her. Yeah, a thong panty shot of an underage girl. 
Keep it classy, Greg. During this time, Ultimate Spider-Man and Kitty Pride of the X-Men were dating. They're swinging around New York, and Kitty is running superhero code names past him. Shadow Cat. Meh. The Cat. Meh. The Shroud. Meh. If you meh me one more time, Kitty, those names suck. Um, you suck. What the hell's wrong with any of those names? Those names aren't you. Two of them have her damn name in them. That would be a better complaint. Otherwise, they exactly capture her. Anyway, they spot the top of the Baxter building friggin' exploding. I guess that explains why they were on the top floor last time then. And naturally, they decide to go investigate. The tracing has reached critical mass, especially when it comes to characters and their wide-open mouths. It's like it's a reaction to the 90s. During that time, everybody was gritting their teeth and snarling! But now, everyone is Donald Sutherland in Invasion of the Body Snatchers. The Squadron Supreme are speaking gibberish, and it's here where we especially notice the porn tracing. For example, the guy in red is Hyperion, the Squadron Supreme Superman equivalent. And he's apparently in the middle of an orgasm. And wait, the black guy in goggles is Blur, their speedster, and he's making the same damn face! Land was so lazy, he did the exact same tracing within the same damn panel! Oh, and spread your legs wide, blue lady. That's a natural pose to be making during a fight. Another Hyperion one here as he tries to reach that high note. And here's the guest artist Jim Ballant for Blur sticking out his tongue for absolutely no reason in this panel. Hyperion eventually punches Ben Grimm, which is only notable to me because it's one of the rare occasions where Land draws Ben's teeth. I don't know why he doesn't like drawing the thing having teeth, but there it is. Oh, and one of the more infamous panels from Greg Land. Spread eagle, open mouth, and yes, most likely from porn. Less talked about is the sound effect. Faboom. That's supposed to be from Hyperion punching Ben Grimm, except its placement is right between that woman's legs. And considering her pose, well, I don't usually indulge in this kind of humor, but quite honestly, it looks like she has rocket-powered flatulence. Meanwhile, Hyperion is really, really struggling with holding it in. Oh, and it's that same O face again. And now here he is trying to eat a sandwich this big. Okay, I, I gotta be honest with you guys. This whole issue is a fight scene. There's just not a lot going on, so... Most of this will just be me riffing on the terrible artwork. I'm not even kidding on how little happens in this. Three whole pages are devoted to Blur trying to catch Hyperion as he falls. And there's just more uncanny valley faces and stuff lifted from porn, and it's just such a mess and so unnecessary. This is why we're covering two issues of this book instead of just going one at a time. Well, that, because issue one wasn't really all that bad aside from the art, so if I'm gonna make up for all the good comics I've talked about lately, we need to get some crap in, and this is the creme de la crap. The gist of what's going on is that the travel from an alternate universe screwed up the squadron's powers and language, so eventually they're able to communicate and fix their powers while the Avengers and X-Men arrive to help deal with the crisis. Because damn it, this is a crossover event comic, and we need to shove in as many characters as possible, even though most of them won't actually do anything in the book. Seriously, Greg Land, how did this ever look good to you? How did this look good to anyone? And really, how difficult is it to fix their mouths? It's not like he lacked any tracings of people with closed mouths. There was screaming porn star Scarlet Witch a second ago, but now here's actual Snake Woman Scarlet Witch showing off how much she loves the Pantene Pro-V she got in her hair between pages. We see the same face on Hyperion two more times! In their universe, when a mom says, stop making faces or it'll get stuck that way, does she mean it with complete sincerity? Oh, and everybody waved to squinting Jean Grey, dull surprise Storm, yawning Cyclops, and shockingly okay-looking Wolverine, aside from the veins bursting through his shirt. Seriously, man, that's not healthy. I don't think your healing factor is working right. Okay, let's get to the point of all this. The Squadron has come to arrest Reed Richards for crimes against humanity. They accuse him of destroying their entire world. 
I don't even know who you are. I've never seen or heard of you before. What world? How could I have destroyed anything? And the purple lady, Power Princess, holds up one of Reed's dimensional probes. When people wonder why Reed Richards is criticized so much, it's because he made a tool for purely scientific analysis and somehow managed to destroy an entire planet with it. That's a bit of a whoopsie. And so our comic ends with Hyperion declaring that Reed will answer for what he's done. And also that the sandwich was really this big. These comics suck. Admittedly, issue one was actually a decent start. I criticize Reed for his poor decision making, but you understand his motivations for doing so. However, the art completely ruins it, especially in issue two when the whole thing is a huge-ass fight scene for no good reason. That is terrible pacing even at the best of times, made worse when this is a mini-series, meaning that crappy, terribly drawn fight sucked up time that could have been used for character development. And when there are so many characters in the panels, it doesn't make for the most epic of fight scenes, it's just a big blob of shapes yelling at each other in incomprehensible dialogue. You can get away with this kind of thing when you know the stakes, are invested in the characters, but we don't get any explanation for what's going on until the last page, so all we're left with is a bunch of people who the reader is not necessarily familiar with making the exact same grandiose poses and faces repeatedly for 20 pages! It's just awful! Next time, it's back to Patreon-sponsored reviews with... something I really wouldn't normally do. Homestuck. Yeah. Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Time to check in again with the crossover between Supreme Power and the Ultimate Universe that nobody asked for. Previously on Ultimate Power, Greg Land, a tracer extraordinaire, drew two terrible issues featuring characters saying dumb, innocuous things, but were otherwise fine. Except, of course, for that whole tracing thing, which gave a lot of people the exact same face, and not in a, oh, they all have the same expression. No, he literally traced the same face multiple times. Ridiculous poses, and various characters being stupid or jerky for no good reason. The plot is centered around Ultimate Reed Richards deciding to send a bunch of interdimensional probes out into the multiverse in the hopes of finding a way to cure Ben Grimm of being the thing. Unfortunately, one of those probes has somehow destroyed the world of supreme power, proving yet again that the only fantastic thing about Reed Richards is how fantastically he can screw up. So let's dig into Ultimate Power number three and see how exactly Reed managed to accomplish this. I'm reading from a trade, but since this episode is kind of short, might as well look at the cover, which feels off. It's your standard two groups rushing at each other thing that's cool, despite how much it doesn't make sense, but the problem here is that Greg Land positioned everybody wrong. See, the idea is supposed to be a use of negative space, each side lined up evenly with a blank space in the center to draw your eyes towards the two teams. But here, they're already inches away from each other. Or in the case of Wolverine and Nighthawk, Eskimo kissing. I love how utterly ridiculous they look like that, especially with the trace drawing of Wolverine's wide open mouth. I bet he's screaming how he's gonna eat him or something. After a recap page explaining what's come until now in the Ultimate Universe, we open in the White House in the Supreme Power Universe. They keep the appearance of the President hidden to try to keep the story from being dated, but screw it, it's a completely separate universe from ours. Just make it be some dude. Hell, follow the Ultimate Universe's example with Samuel L. Jackson's Nick Fury and make it Morgan Freeman or someone. Speaking of actors, the President is complaining about an actor and his wife in the Lincoln bedroom. Okay. No more actor sleepovers. They're never interested in gossiping about boys with me. I don't care how much they gave to who. Yes, sir. In the Supreme Power Universe, Oscar award-winning actor and director Tommy Wiseau can buy or sell any politician he pleases. This is the White House, for heaven's sake. I'm supposed to be the one to defame this place, not some actor. 
The Secret Service quickly wakes him up and drags him to the safe house, since there's some kind of biomass surrounding the White House, growing tendrils over the front of it. In fact, a pullback reveals that the biomass is all over DC, with several buildings on fire too. We see Hyperion and Power Princess, the supreme power equivalents of Superman and Wonder Woman, flying around and surveying the carnage, but something seems up with Hyperion, who's sweating heavily. Are... are you okay? Something's... WRONG! WHY DO I HAVE TO PEE RIGHT NOW? I DID IT BEFORE WE LEFT! And just as another highlight of how poorly constructed this book is, you remember Marvel number three and the bizarre choice to shove all of the script and dialogue into the sides of the page? Well, this is better than that, since they actually bothered to put them in caption boxes, but it's still a terrible wall of text that doesn't really say much of anything. As I've said, some creators are capable of pulling this off, but in this case, it's just panic talk by the president, coupled with exposition that should be coming from you know, the heroes, and not somebody whose face we can never ever show. The panels are just showing poorly drawn images of the Squadron Supreme engaging the biomass in battle or rescuing people. Enjoy Power Princess here with her stick figure legs while this guy down here practices his yawning. I mean, this is amateur hour right here, crowding the pages with unnecessary text. This is how not to do exposition, kids. Hell, it'd be better if what they were saying had anything at all to do with what we're actually seeing on the page, but it's not. You could shove in Tim Drake's speech about the history of marijuana into this, and it'd work just as well. The president wants to know what the hell these things are, but naturally nobody knows right now. They're not just in DC either. They're sprouting up all over the world, and in America, a good chunk of the eastern seaboard is being overrun by them. Sir, you need to call for a full scale evacuation. Of the entire eastern seaboard? And where should I put everyone? Your house? Uh, honey, we're having guests over for a few days. We need to order some pizza. A lot of pizza. Yeah, I'll start getting orders from everyone and I'll call you back. Oh, hey, look, on this page, the Scarlet Witch is running in the crowd. Maybe she can help it. Oh, wait, never mind. That is just another face that Greg Land has already used in the last issue. Anywho, the biomass is either altering the atmosphere to suit its own needs, or its very presence is warping the environment. Oxygen content and barometric pressure are changing rapidly. The president starts panicking in the caption boxes. But then he's much calmer when we actually cut to the Situation Room. Well, actually, it's not the Situation Room, since in the caption boxes, the President was talking about getting the Joint Chiefs together if this is some kind of invasion or biological attack, and I'd have to imagine that they'd be here by now if that was the case. I joked a lot last week about the government, but even I don't think they're that useless that they wouldn't be here by now, given all this. You're incapable of that level of incompetence, Mr. LaForge. I also can't imagine the situation situation room being this dark. I'm just saying, the last thing you need in a crisis is to accidentally trip over your own chair because a light bulb burned out. So yeah, they're just in some random room full of television monitors that are just depicting footage of what's going on outside. Right before the biomass showed up, there was some kind of energy surge, which prompts them to contact Hyperion and tell him to get to New York. Speaking of, Hyperion is trying to figure out some of the problems he's having with combating the biomass. Why can't I pick them up? I don't know. Why can't I lift them and throw them into the sea? I don't know. Do you even lift, bro? They have no weight, no substance. It's like trying to fight fat-free yogurt. They suspect that the biomass actually comes from a different plane of existence and that the energy surge specifically occurred in New York. Whatever caused that surge is somewhere in the city and Hyperion needs to find it. He locates it, but there's some kind of strange radiation emitting from it that's causing him pain. However, he finally locates it and manages to rip it out of the biomass in this panel that was not only reused from the last time, but also is just an unfortunate choice to use, since it makes it look like biomass is gonna drip into Hyperion's mouth. Ew. But yeah, the thing he locates is, of course, Reed Richards' probe device from the first issue. Taking it to a lab, they analyze it and discover it's broadcasting information. A scan by the hero Spectrum activates a holographic recording of Reed. My name is Reed Richards, and I am broadcasting this message in colloquial English, a popular language on the planet Earth in my home dimension. Well, it's popular now, but just you wait. Swahili's gonna take the lead any day now. Your scanners or probing devices triggered this message, and my message to you 
is one of peace. The peaceful biomass is converting oxygen and your environment into something humans can't survive in, in the name of love and friendship. This data retrieval sensor is just that, and in no way a weapon or an act of hostility of any kind. That being said, I apologize in advance if any of you stood too close to the probe because, oh boy, um, you're sterile now. I am part of a group of super-powered adventurers and scientists working towards a goal of peace and technological achievement. All the data recovered from your dimension is being used for the grand idea of scientific advancement. What he means is that they're actually inserting spyware into their dimension for targeted marketing purposes. And if you have the technology to respond to this message, I will gladly share my research with you as a gesture of good faith. And if you object to what I'm doing, well, I'll just release your search histories for everyone to see. Yes, even you, Carl. I know what you did. Those assembled are naturally a bit pissed off that some 18-year-old screwing around with interdimensional travel has caused a massive disaster for their world that, as far as I can tell, is still happening for them. What's worse, the technology of the probe is so advanced they're not sure how to reverse the damage that's been done. Hyperion says they need to bring Reed to their universe to fix it. This is in spite of the fact that they just admitted they didn't even know that other dimensions existed before this, so how the hell they have the technology to travel to another universe is not explained. But Hyperion figures that since they have superpowered individuals on their Earth, they should send in the full squadron to deal with any problems they might encounter along the way. Good idea, Hyperion. Send the entirety of the superpowered beings at your disposal to another dimension against a technologically superior force with unknown capabilities while there are still thousands, if not millions, of people who need help. Brilliant strategy! Magnificent bastard, I read your book! And cut back to where we left off at the end of issue two. Only everyone's posing, including the wasp here, who is apparently lounging around in the air near Wolverine's claws. And instead of talking like they were before, they're all ready to throw down yet again. Hyperion is now screaming his head off about putting Reed Richards on trial for crimes against humanity, even though he was in the meeting when they discovered that this was all a terrible, idiotic accident. Oh, and despite the fact that in the last issue, Hyperion said that Reed destroyed their world, we know that is not true at all, and this issue has him instead saying he put his world in danger. Great continuity! And yet you'd think they'd have legitimately great continuity, what with Greg Land tracing the same images over and over and over again, thus ensuring that everything looks consistent. Reed surrenders and says he'll go with them while everyone else is asking what the hell he did. This is yet again a reason why I actually like this version. He knew what he did was wrong and he's taking responsibility for it. However, I now know what happened after a lot of these events. Being unfamiliar with the majority of the Ultimate Universe, I got told by a lot of people that Ultimate Reed Richards eventually went crazy and became a supervillain called The Maker, since, let's face it, it's a superhero comic with a likable character. We've gotta grind that humanity and compassion down without any plans for a redemption arc. No, 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 no. How dare we like someone who isn't a colossal asshole. Oh, and get this, apparently one of the reasons why he went crazy is because Sue Storm rejected his marriage proposal. Well, I mean, they couldn't let Mr. Fantastic be married. It might artificially age the guy whose most well-known look is having gray hair on the sides of his head. Sue refuses to let Reed go with them, even after he admits that this is his fault, which results in Hyperion yelling, Tom! which causes the force field to destabilize. At least that's what I presume is what he's doing. I'm sure the intent was that he hit it, but there were no motion lines, and I don't know why he's suddenly yelling at the top of his lungs in this panel. Greg Land's artwork is what happens when you make a comic entirely composed of videos paused right in the middle of someone talking. The other heroes prepare to rush the squadron, but Reed once again tells them to calm down, since he is responsible for this, and he admits to Nick Fury that he was right about pulling this crap. And so the squadron departs in a rainbow, much to Sue's horror. She then goes from those emotions to pouty-lipped snarling at the other heroes for not stopping him. 
You people just stood there! They stood there because I told them to. And I told them to because we're not having a superpower battle of that magnitude in the heart of New York City on a weekday. Too bad it's Sunday. Those buildings would have been filled up tomorrow. Still, despite Reed's idiocy, Fury plans on putting together a rescue team. The Fantastic Four, of course, volunteer, but he says not all of them will be coming. Then this traced picture of Captain America asks what the plan is. Yeah, Greg used that same image on the cover of the first issue. Must be really easy to get comics out on time when the majority of your job involves hitting Control C and Control V. And so our comic ends with Nick Fury raising a big ass gun and saying he's working on it. This is my thinking gun. This comic sucks, but mainly because it's technically inept. Story-wise, the biggest flaw here is in pacing. We're on the third issue of this crossover event comic that has repercussions down the line a full third of the way through it, and not much has happened. Reed Richards screwed up, Squadron Supreme and Marvel Heroes fight each other. That's all that's really happened. It's taking its sweet time, but it's not using that time effectively. In fact, despite it moving at a snail's pace, a bunch of exposition and unnecessary speculation are crammed into two pages despite the reader already knowing what's going on. The stuff inconsequential characters are discussing is not interesting enough in its own right. And then the art is so terrible in its repetition and lack of cohesion that it just makes the whole thing feel like a waste of time. Next time, we continue our celebration of Star Trek's 50th anniversary with another issue of the early days of the next generation. Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Time for another issue of Ultimate Power, where everyone gets a chance to be drawn like they're experiencing the worst constipation ever. For those of you just joining us, Ultimate Power is a crossover between Marvel's Ultimate Universe and the Supreme Power Universe, two lines of books all about reimagining Marvel characters in a modern, sometimes darker context. Usually that means cannibalism for some reason. This nine-issue crossover miniseries has so far wasted about three issues worth of time in one of the worst examples of decompressed storytelling ever, stretching a very thin plot so far even thinner. Reed Richards, desperate to find a cure for Ben Grimm's thingness, sent out a few multidimensional probes into other realities in the hopes that they would somehow allow him to find said cure. Unfortunately, one of those probes entered the Supreme Power Universe and brought along with it some kind of weird organic mass that is quickly consuming their Earth and converting the oxygen in the atmosphere into something more suiting it. Naturally, this might be kind of a major bummer for the people of their world, so they followed the signal the probe was transmitting back to the Ultimate Universe and engaged in battle with several superheroes. At the end of the last issue, Reed surrendered himself to them and went along willingly, although Nick Fury promised to assemble a team to retrieve him. It was also our first opportunity to look at the artwork of notorious artist Greg Land, known for tracing, and being so terrible about his tracing that he will constantly reuse the same shots over and over and over. Behold the equivalent of making entire comics out of stock clip art. Let's dig into Ultimate Power number four and see what faces Land decides to use this time. While we're reading from a trade, if the other episodes are anything to go by, it's probably going to be a shorter episode, so might as well look at the cover. It's actually fairly decent compositionally, featuring a battered Reed Richards in shadow up front, his arms locked in high-tech handcuffs, which admittedly look like they came off of an industrial typewriter, but still, while four Supreme Power characters stand behind him in the light, passing judgment on him. Man, everyone is giving Reed the thumbs down. How bad a reality show contestant could he be? Admittedly, this cover might have a little more impact if these were people Reed actually knew and cared about, but it's still good regardless. After the recap page, we open with, well, a direct first sighting of Greg Land's tracing. How do I know? Because the wasp up there has the exact same face as Power Princess from the cover. Did Greg Land hope that we would forget what the cover looks like in the time it would take to flip two pages? Or in the case of the trade, from left to right? 
So anyway, we pick up right where we left off last time. And by that, I mean the last issue ended with the heroes asking Nick Fury, what's the plan? And he held up a gun and proclaimed, I'm thinking about it. While this one has those lines, only now everyone's crowded around Nick Fury, who is neither holding up a gun nor looking at everyone else, with everyone else now looking at something besides him. How do you screw up the continuity of one issue to the next when it's the same writer and artist? At least Countdown had the excuse of multiple creators not being able to keep things straight. And yes, I am still citing Countdown this many years later. Unlike this comic, I can remember stuff that happened before! So, um, what are we looking at? The implication is supposed to be that everyone's looking at Spidey, except clearly everyone is looking above him. Like, you can't match the eye lines at all. Anyway, what are they looking at with such awe and reverence? Or in the Wasp's case, dull surprise? The S.H.I.E.L.D. Helicarrier. Yeah, not being familiar enough with the Ultimate Universe to know whether or not its appearance here is meant to be such a big deal or not. But regardless, Nick Fury justifies its presence. With Reed's equipment damaged, we need to move fast. The Helicarrier will take a strike team to whoever can show us how to follow Reed. Um, Nick? Into whichever dimension the others took him. We... Nick? Mr. Fury? Nicky Poo? Nicky Poo? Sorry, that was my subtle way of telling you I need to go to the bathroom. Just... What the hell is this scene? Why is Spidey interrupting Nick Fury? He says it's because he needed to get his attention to tell him his idea to use Thor to transport them to the Supreme Power Universe. Here's the problem, though. Nick Fury hadn't said that he didn't know how to transport them to their universe yet. Spidey interrupted to offer a solution to a problem before anyone said it was going to be a problem. Oh, sure. Nick implied that they didn't know by saying, whoever can show us how to follow Reed, but why didn't he just wait for him to stop talking before suggesting it? See, when I saw you looking up, and we were all looking up, and I looked up, I thought we were all looking at the same thing, but... What is your point? I wasn't looking at the helicarrier. I was looking at him. I mean, I am a teenager under this mask. Isn't he just a heartthrob? Holy crap land. I know Peter's still a teenager in this continuity, but I'm pretty sure at this point his head should not be so tiny compared to Thor's. Thor still just resembles a very strong looking dude in this continuity. Why is it you could fit two Spider-Mans inside of him? You're the God of Thunder, right? Verily. So I'm guessing that hammer of yours Mjolnir. Majolnar? Majognar? Mjolnir. How do you spell that? Well, in English, you spell it MJ. Oh, for the love of God, would you shut up and move on already? Anyway, Mjolnir has the ability to take Thor anywhere, and since the energy trail for the Squadron Supreme is still fresh, they can open up a dimensional portal and follow them to their Earth. Good idea. Get smart. Makes sense to me. You're standing on my foot. Sorry. So what are we waiting for? How did he spell that? Get on with it. Yes, get on with it! Fury got owned. How? Did, did we turn over two pages at once? How did he own him? And who gives a crap right now if he was or not? Why do you people care? Why am I even reading this? Spidey's got a point, Nick. He has a suggestion. Why are they pretending this is him showing up Nick Fury when it's just him being helpful? So what is Fury's reaction to this? And once Thor opens the dimensional portal, we're gonna need the helicarrier to get everyone to the other side, aren't we? Yes, sir. So I was right, wasn't I? Yes, sir. Right about what? There wasn't any argument! Is there some special edition of this comic that includes the deleted scenes that explain this exchange? Anyway, with everyone coming on board the helicarrier, they get to work. Can you pick up the energy signature, Thor? Verily! What's his deal with verily all the time? I... Shut up! All right then, we've got everything buckled down, and some things webbed down. I said shut up! And I'm saying it too! Enough with the completely useless babbling in this issue! We'd be there by now if not for it! Thor warns them that the energy of the hammer might be too much for them to take, asking if they still want to proceed. But Fury gives it a go-ahead. Then let the heavens be torn asunder! Let us be carried by lightning and storm! Let the world fall asunder! The sky be ripped away! And this world be left behind! See, now if the superfluous dialogue was more like a thunder god ripping a hole in the space-time continuum into another universe, then I wouldn't have much to complain about! Mind you, the awesomeness is kind of undercut by the next page, immediately showing a very traced Thor traveling through the portal with the helicarrier behind him, but still, credit where credit is due. I wonder where Thor was traced from originally. A wrestler, maybe? I don't know. 
Over in the Supreme Hour Earth, the military leaders have already figured out that if the Ultimate Universe was able to casually send interdimensional probes out, they probably have a way of following them back to their Earth, and they need to be prepared for another incursion. Fortunately for them, they have Hyperion standing guard in orbit. Reed is, of course, working on finding a way to fix this catastrophe, and has a theory on what the biomass is. The cellular structure is similar to a spore I've discovered on other extra-dimensional expeditions, but it was a simple one-celled organism. Biological logically inert. Wait, it's a spore doing something nonsensical? We are actually dealing with a new spore of madness? My only guess is that as it passed through the interdimensional rift, the energy surrounding the probe interacted somehow with the spores, which hitchhiked onto the probe as it passed through them, sped up their evolutionary process so that when they got here, and then, well, do they have moldy jello in this universe? Reed asks how many people have died thanks to this, and another official says they estimated in the tens of millions, much to his horror. I was sure I'd compensated for this possibility. I took every precaution to guarantee that nothing organic could adhere to the probe's skin and avoid contamination. I don't understand. Hey man, it happens. Mildew can strike when you least expect it. That's why I trust Vincent Price with this stuff. Spray on Tylex Instant Mildew Stain Remover, and mildew stains vanish with no scrubbing. Try Tylex and escape the torture of scrubbing. With them is Dr. Emil Burbank, the Squadron Supreme version of Lex Luthor. Question, Reed. I've always wondered what it must feel like to kill millions of people all at once. Since I'm never gonna have the chance to meet a Hitler or a Stalin, I was wondering if you could tell me what it's like to- Newbie, if the next two words out of your mouth aren't see you, then the third word will be, oh my god, my crotch, you've punched me in the crotch. By the way, spoilers in case you cared, the guy who is transparently evil and would love to ask dictators what it's like to murder millions of people is one of the real villains of the story, so this question is in reality more superfluous dialogue. I mean, given what we later learn in Ultimate Power about the guy and his part in this, it just makes me wonder why they didn't help set up that reveal other than, so who else has got a murder boner right now? Reed is, of course, pissed at him. Ironic, given what apparently happens to the poor kid in the Ultimate Universe. But Reed has been set up with electrical devices that Burbank can use to shock him if he tries to escape. Now, as I was saying, before you're put on trial and convicted of crimes against humanity and introduced to a far more powerful jolt of electricity than the one I just showed you, tell me, how do we stop that stuff from adding even more numbers to your already quite astonishing body count? That's what you were gonna ask Hitler and Stalin? I don't know, just seems like they wouldn't care all that much about it. Reed says he honestly doesn't know how to fix this, and naturally is breaking down a bit as a result. Fortunately, the cavalry is almost there. On board the helicarrier, they page Nick Fury, but he's not answering. As such, Captain America sends Shadowcat to go look for him. She finds him, phasing through walls to do so. By the way, nice slight ass shot of the teenage girl land. Admittedly, we've seen worse underage panty shots in comics, but one has to question why she was drawn in this way to do so in the first place. Also, randomly phasing through walls seems like kind of a bad idea here, especially when you're in the middle of a dimensional tunnel and could wind up phasing out of the ship. Anyway, she finally finds him inside of an odd room, talking to someone in shadows. I'll talk about this room in a moment, but first, dialogue. You're sure Richard suspects nothing? Affirmative. So we're gonna go in, get him, clean this up, and get the hell out before any of this can bounce back on us. And I'm absolutely certain they can't follow us back to our own reality like they've done once before because... Well, it isn't very well written. He also mentions that they can't let Reed take a close look at any of the probes because he's smart enough to recognize what he and the mysterious figure did to them. But enough about that, let's talk about this room. Nick Fury is in some secret room talking with some mysterious person whom we don't see in this issue. Well, I can see why he'd want to hide someone in this space. After all, no one else in S.H.I.E.L.D. can be allowed to learn that this is where he records his Star Trek fan films. Because this room is the bridge of the Enterprise-E! Seriously, take a look! That's what it is! Behold, Greg Land, who couldn't draw a freaking wall without tracing it! Fury walks out of the room to find Kitty standing there. She says Cap sent her to find him. Come on, let's get to the bridge. But you just left the bridge! Two bridges? Even Kitty is confused by this. Look at her turning around and staring at it as they walk away. Ship has one bridge. One bridge! 
Over in Supreme Power Land, Power Princess has decided to be traced as she goes to visit Hyperion. Having not read Supreme Power before, I looked it up, and she apparently might have a thing about wanting to conquer the Earth, and her and Hyperion are together, but beyond that, I don't know much, so I don't know how out of character this is for her. My love, they do not see you as we do. A star, compressed beyond imagination, needing only a single spark to light the fire. And then... Arson! It will be beautiful. We will be beautiful. Oh, Power Princess, you're already traced from someone pretty. Do not open your eyes, my love, but continue to listen. Nice save to cover up that he didn't draw someone whose eyes were open. Listen to those that crawl across the broken rind of the world below. Denied flight. Denied the sky. Denied the stars. Listen. What do you hear? Well, I hear a woman who can talk in space. What's up with that? Basically, her spiel is that he should let most of humanity be killed by the biomass and only save those willing to let him save them, aka together they can rule the galaxy or whatever. Before he can answer her, Hyperion spots the arriving helicarrier. Now, you might think that this is hinting at some sort of betrayal by Hyperion against his world. Or maybe Power Princess decides to let people die and turn her into a full-fledged villain. But you would be wrong. Because nothing comes of this. At all. Which makes this scene... So yeah, Thor and the Helicarrier emerge from a portal. I don't know, every time I see one of Greg Land's male characters in the screamy face like this one, I just imagine them making that weird yell from the Garzy's Wing DVD. <laughs> Fury tells the group to get ready, since it's likely they'll be detected quickly, but one of the S.H.I.E.L.D. officers, who looks like he may be diseased or something given the splotchy coloring, proclaims that they may not even have time for that. And so our comic ends with a splash page showing Hyperion about to collide with Thor. Wouldn't it be nice if they hit each other, exploded, and then we were spared the rest of this series? Ah, <sighs> one can dream. This comic sucks! We're almost at the halfway point of this series, and it has proceeded at a snail's pace. This issue did not help matters, especially when so much of it was dedicated to padding. If the scene between Hyperion and Power Princess is in character for them, then it does nothing to advance them as characters, nor does it really give us any further insight into them. It's just wasting time. The opening bits of dialogue are just as useless, since it feels like we're missing parts of it. The only things that actually happen in this issue are the Ultimate Universe heroes traveling to the Supreme Power Universe, and Reed Richards speculating about what caused all this. And he's wrong, by the way. The best bit is Reed reflecting on just how catastrophic a mistake he's made. It's solid stuff, but that's the only thing of substance in this crap. The dialogue is trite and frustrating, the artwork gets worse the more you recognize the same repeated bits of tracing that Greg Land does nothing with to make it any more compelling than the last 50 times he used it. Why they stretched this thing to nine issues confuses me when they haven't even made one issue compelling so far, is anyone's guess. Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. You know, in the past, I have been far too vindictive and mean to creators on this show. Not always. I will stand by aggression towards creators who have been bigoted, Frank Miller, Gary Brodsky, but there have been times where I have been unjustly pissed off at people over what's really a difference of opinion. One of those that comes to mind is Joe Casada. Say what you will about One More Day, and I have said a lot, but me screaming at the camera that he's a hack is out of line. No, really, it is. He didn't write the segment that got me to scream that, and really it was built around a creative decision. A decision that I strongly, firmly believe is wrong for Peter Parker and who his character is. But ultimately, he was trying to do what he thought was best for the character too, and I shouldn't condemn someone for a bad creative decision. All creators do that, and in the future, both the near and far variety, we will be talking about creators who made mistakes and were vilified for it. Sometimes by myself at that. I am just a superhero comics fan, and my opinion is no more valid than anyone else's. I should call bad work bad, but I should never attack a creator so aggressively for a creative decision I disagree with. That's not cool. I'll criticize decisions, sure, but ultimately we're here to talk about the quality of the work itself and how much effort a creator will pour into said work. So anyway, let's talk about how lazy a creator Greg Land is to the point where he traced the Starship Enterprise for friggin' backgrounds. Is Greg Land a bad person? 
I don't think so. I've never heard any controversies about the guy related to him as a person. So he might be an amiable, wonderful, not bigoted, enthusiastic kind of man. But as an artist, he is awful. Sacrificing consistency in character models to trace the same damn things over and over and over and over and over and over, and we've seen it a ton already in this series. You think about George Perez putting in so much work on JLA slash Avengers that he actually injured himself. He cared that much about doing the best possible job he could, and then you have Land's boring, lackluster tracing that he had no problem giving to Marvel to sell. And Marvel itself seeing no problem with telling people to pay for it. And you can't even argue that the story makes it worth it. Barely anything has happened in four issues! To sum up, Ultimate Reed Richards, in an attempt to finally find a cure for Ben Grimm's condition, sent out a few probes to other dimensions. However, one of the probes unwittingly brought with it strange microbes to the Supreme Power Universe creating some kind of organic mass that's consuming their planet. They forcibly took Reed Richards back with them, and now a strike team of various Ultimate Universe characters are on their way to the Supreme Power Universe to take him back. Also, Nick Fury is up to secret shenanigans. On the bridge of the Enterprise, based on the traced art. So let's dig into Ultimate Power number 5 and see how much more nothing will be happening. from a trade, so no cover analysis. Not that it's particularly interesting to begin with, but this does give me a chance to clear up some confusion I had from last time. Namely, that the writers changed hands after issue 3. Yes, issues 1 to 3 were written by Brian Michael Bendis, 4 to 6 by J. Michael Straczynski, and 7 to 9 by Jeff Loeb. The reason why it was done like this is because the Kool-Aid man is red. Yeah, I couldn't find anything that explains why the hell this is the case. My best guess is that it's because Bendis had originally created Ultimate Spider-Man and written it for the longest time, Straczynski was the writer of Supreme Power, and Loeb would become the Ultimates writer after Mark Miller, doing both Ultimates 3 and Ultimatum, so that's a great track record right there. Although why they didn't just work in a collaborative capacity on all the issues to maintain consistency rather than just having them each write three is beyond me. Anyway, we open with the S.H.I.E.L.D. helicarrier arriving in the Supreme Power universe with Thor at the front. General Fury, we've got incoming! You think? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I'll just assume you can psychically detect what's happening outside of the ship and then not report on what's going on. This is why you get paid more than me. Hyperion is the aforementioned incoming, and Thor is sent to intercept him. And I'm pretty sure Greg Land just traced the two in the exact same pose, same kind of muscle in their arm for this shot. Admittedly, I'll give you that from a composition standpoint it looks cool, but I think this is the first time he traced the same thing in consecutive panels. Oh, and despite the first page establishing Mjolnir is in Thor's right hand, it's suddenly in his left hand. I'm basing that off of the lightning effects aimed right at Hyperion. And then in the next page, they're no longer flying right at each other, but floating in the air exchanging punches with Mjolnir back in his right hand. Space is warped and time is bendable. I say exchanging punches, but it looks more like Hyperion swung at him and missed while Thor is just trying to give him a big hug, since his punching hand is just somewhere behind Hyperion's back. Oh, dude. The thing and Spidey react like what just happened was the most impressive, epic thing they have ever beheld, while I'm still just trying to figure out why Thor is yawning. Nick Fury dispatches Sue and Johnny Storm out to get help. They're too evenly matched, and I don't like to lose. And I figure putting some people much more squishable than Thor to be turned into targets will keep me from losing. He also says it's to help him buy some time to find Reed, which gets them to go and help. Both Spidey and Captain America object to this. Except for Iron Man, who I'm keeping in reserve, those are the only people I can spare who can fly or levitate or whatever. You want to try webbing across on the clouds or skimming the air on that shield? Feel free. Okay, Cap, new plan forming. I sit on your shield and then you launch me at Hyperion. He also thinks, quite bluntly, that the others are expendable. Reed is the one they need to make sure comes back. Expendable? Reed Richards, with everything he knows, could give our enemies enough information to destroy our world. Yeah, but he's also in the process of destroying a world because of what he didn't know, so I think it goes either way at this point. He's that smart? 
Fine. Next time he's buying lunch. Dude lives in a big-ass government-funded tower and has action figures and super expensive dimensional portal tech. Was he not picking up the check beforehand? Oh, who am I kidding? Ultimate Reed Richards apparently became a supervillain later, so of course he wasn't. As it happens, Sue and Johnny are trained and know how to fight in a situation like this, so their first idea is to seal Hyperion up in a force field bubble. While she can hold him for a bit, his punches are strong enough to cause a nosebleed in Sue from the strain. Also, I'm starting to wonder if Ultimate Sue Storm is possessed by the alien from the Thing from Another World, Eternal Vows, because her hair keeps moving around like it has a mind of its own. Anyway, she doesn't think she can hold him for long, so she opens up a small hole in the bubble to allow the Human Torch to... Well, torch him. How about a little fire, Scarecrow? You realize in this analogy that makes you the Wicked Witch, right, Johnny? Hyperion, being a Superman XP, completely ignores the flames and just keeps punching at the force field hard enough to knock Sue back a bit. Thor goes to help her while Johnny unleashes his full power on the sphere. And I'm just frankly wondering how that fire is still going when all the air in that bubble must have run out. Sure, there's a hole, but he's just pouring more fire into said hole. I don't think any oxygen can get inside fast enough to refill it. And it does nothing. Hyperion shoots some heat vision, or whatever he has in this universe, laser eyes, and blows up the force bubble. Johnny falls, having expended his flame, but fortunately Sue manages to save him with a force field bubble, somehow having arrived at the ground before him. I don't know, maybe Thor put her down there earlier? Either way, it did wonders for her unkempt hair. And now Hyperion's naked, and a pissed off Thor is ready to hit him with Mjolnir, but Hyperion stops him and even takes the weapon away. I admit, I don't know if the Ultimate Universe Hammer has the same enchantment as the regular one, but it definitely seems to surprise Thor. Odin's blood! No, your blood. I mean, technically speaking, being Odin's son, I do have Odin's blood too. He knocks Thor out and drops him to the ground, letting go of Mjolnir too, since he doesn't really need it. Back at the helicarrier, Fury says their target is this universe's version of Washington, D.C. How can we even be sure they have a version of D.C.? Maybe this version of Earth is run by Russia, or China, or... Or New Jersey. Welcome to Minneapolis, Minnesota, capital of the United States. Ooh, helicarrier in the sky. That's different. Why don't you come on down? Wally's gonna take us ice fishing later. He's pretty certain that DC is the same in both universes, and that that's where they'll find Reed. Come, Pietro. Let us hope that his certainty about the location of Reed Richards is not the same as the vaunted American certainty about the locations of weapons of mass destruction. Topical. Also, you're banging your brother, Wanda. Don't think I've forgotten about that. Boy, is it awkward to see Cyclops in the same room as Quicksilver, considering Pietro's the one who assassinates him at the end of Ultimatum. Spidey and Cap secretly talk to each other through a notepad. Nick knows something he's not telling us. What? How? Why? See, even Spidey knows that the true question is, why is Gamora? Fury notices them doing this. You ladies got something to say? And Spidey stuffs the note in his mouth. It is admittedly funny. Rother. Good. Keep it that way. I see nothing wrong with you guys passing secret notes around. Certainly nothing to be worried about. I am so good at my job. Down in DC, Reed is taken from his cell. Sir, you're to come with us. Why? You're being transferred to a more secure location. I'm not entirely sure that's an answer to why. I don't think Reed quite understands how it works when you're a prisoner. I'm not cleared for that kind of information. It's a lot of backup for someone who gave himself up peacefully. Is there a problem? I'm not cleared for that kind of information either. What kind of information are you cleared for? I'm not cleared for that kind of information. I see you're not cleared to be funny either. Also, I can't be certain because Land kept everyone's faces in the shadows, so the color tones could just be wrong, but I'm pretty sure the guard he's talking to switches hairstyle, color, and eventually his skin color within three panels. When the area starts rumbling, Reed stretches his head into an air vent that leads outside so he can look at what's happening. And so issue five ends with him spotting the superheroes of the two universes fighting each other. I wasn't originally planning on doing anything more, but honestly, this thing felt really short. Another example of how terribly paced the comic is. So let's dig into issue six and continue on. There are some things you never see more than once in your lifetime. Like Marvel, you shouldn't see that more than once. Or just see it zero times. Zero is good too. And as Nick Fury looked out the window of the helicarrier, he knew that this was at least five of them. Huh, 
Five clouds that look like bunnies. Neat. The Squadron Supreme rallied to combat the heroes, with Blur and Quicksilver engaged in a super speed brawl, and Dr. Spectrum unsuccessfully blasting Iron Man. Welcome to the Majors! So, now that we've learned you like to accessorize with jewelry, what else you got? The only shiny thing I want to see is a liquor bottle. Does alcohol taste different in your universe? On the ground, Power Princess fights Ben Grimm. We see you. Did he have a cloaking device on? They punch each other, with Land repeating a particular shot of Ben Grimm that he loves to reuse that makes him look like a 3D Pac-Man. Back in the building where Reed is being kept, he meets up with Dr. Burbank, that Lex Luthor equivalent from the Supreme Power Universe. He requests the chance to get his friends to stand down, since he's voluntarily trying to help. He even demonstrates that their restraint device isn't working on him, and he could leave at any time, but Burbank says he has a solution to his problem. And that involves getting Reed unconscious with a knockout gas. Wait a second, are you telling me the guy who was transparently evil in issue 4 and talked about how much he wanted to talk to Hitler about murdering people was evil?! What a twist! Back on the helicarrier, Fury asks the Scarlet Witch why she hasn't joined the battle. She reveals that she can sense the Squadron Supreme's own magic user, Arcana, and is kind of afraid to try to fight her given the nature of her powers. For instance, she has the power to be clearly traced from porn. Actually, it's that her powers- Good lord, that artwork! This is what happens when you trace from multiple different sources and Frankenstein them together! Those legs do not go with that torso, and I'm pretty sure her arms are different lengths and widths! Also, her hairstyle, of course, changes between panels, because that's just par for the course. Anyway, she's worried about Arcana's powers. I sense that her powers come not from traditional sources. Because, of course, chaos magic or magic just in general, is a traditional source in the Marvel Universe. But from an understanding of the quantum mechanical forces that are the very underpinnings of reality, to set my powers against hers might cause, well, for lack of a better term, an implosion of natural laws. Yeah? Yeah? What's that mean? That it could potentially tear this world asunder and destroy it. Given how your body keeps stretching and compressing right now, I'm pretty sure an implosion of natural laws is already happening. Nick Fury does not care. It's not my world. You know, what was so great about the Ultimate Universe was that you got to see modern versions of characters without years of continuity baggage. Which apparently meant everyone is really just a colossal dick. Anyway, here's a two-page spread with more traced artwork, and my belief that this is one of the few shots of Arcana that was not traced from porn. Since I'm pretty sure those spindly, thin legs were actually traced from a rubber bendy doll. With all the heroes now gone, Nick Fury tells the helicarrier staff to wait for the tipping point, and goes to arm himself with tons of guns and ammunition. The implication in his narration is that him joining the battle will be said tipping point, but then he goes to his secret Enterprise-E room instead. He informs the person inside the room, which now looks more like some kind of training room, though I think there are some L-cars displays behind some of this stuff in it, that he's going in to grab Reed Richards' probes while everyone's distracted, saying that he'll try to save as many heroes as he can before they run like hell, but the probes are his priority. And the other guy zaps him with red lightning and knocks him out. Fury's attempt to return fire attracts a bunch of shield forces that the unseen person knocks out. And then I'm pretty sure that same guy shows up on the ground and steps on the Wasp and Tom Thumb, who have shrunken down. You stupid fool of a human being! What the hell were you thinking?! Your stupid minds! Stupid! Stupid! Scarlet Witch and Arcana- Okay, seriously now? What is Greg Land's obsession with drawing Arcana doing the splits?! Like, even if it wasn't traced from porn, why only that pose for her? Every battle she's doing that, as if her powers depended on her feet being as far apart as possible! The two are knocked out by the unseen assailant, while Dr. Spectrum hears a voice in his head that compels him to stop fighting Iron Man and protect the children. I must 
save the children. And on the ground, Ben Grimm spots the new player and is disbelieving who it is. Back on board the helicarrier, Spider-Man wakes Fury up, saying he stayed behind to get answers from him. Fury insists he let him go, lest everyone on the mission be killed. They run to the bridge and get a fix on who it is who is responsible for this. And so our comic ends with the revelation of who it was who came along. Doctor Doom. Yes, very nice! A new universe! A new world to conquer! A new tomorrow! A new Doom! Yes, Doom has a new hobby beyond playing a Pokemon Yellow randomized Nuzlocke! Watch the livestream archive, Doom makes sense in context. In the meantime, Doom declares that these comics suck! Issue 6 is definitely better than Issue 5, if only because stuff finally starts happening! But that's at the two-thirds mark of the miniseries. And unfortunately, the artwork continues to do this story no favors, with a lot of unnecessary splash pages and two-page spreads with land standard paint-by-numbers tracing on display. Issue 5 barely has anything happening aside for a battle against Hyperion, who is noticeably absent from the brawl in Issue 6. There's not really much more that can be said about this that I haven't already said throughout. It's padded to hell, and the only redeeming factor here is the plot twist with Doom which honestly doesn't make much sense given what had kind of happened to Ultimate Doctor Doom, but that's a story for another day. Or rather, for Marvel Zombies. Go check out Moarte's old summertime videos covering them for an explanation for what happened there. But yeah, while issue 6 is a marked improvement given the plot is finally developing, this should have happened much earlier and the artwork is terrible. Next time, we begin a five-week look at comics that were adapted for movies, starting off with our final look at the Batman Quad trilogy with Batman Forever's adaptation. Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. So I guess when I ended up doing two issues of Ultimate Power in 2019, my brain decided, eh, I don't have to do one in 2020. So yeah, since it was like a hundred episodes ago when we last looked at this series, a quick recap. Ultimate Reed Richards is an idiot, and as many people were keen to point out, a supervillain later, thanks Marvel, and sent out probes to other dimensions in the hopes of finding a cure for Ultimate Ben Grimm's condition as the thing. Instead, he ended up accidentally creating some kind of biological weapon in the Supreme Power Universe, wherein the Squadron Supreme of that Earth went to grab him, and he voluntarily surrendered. But Nick Fury led a massive group of superheroes out to retrieve him, apparently taking the friggin' USS Enterprise E because Grimm Greg Land traced from that just like he traces everything in his art! And anyway, Evil Von Evilton Emil Burbank knocks Reed Richards unconscious instead of letting him calm down the heroes coming after him, while it's revealed that Nick Fury has been working with Doctor Doom this whole time, who blasts Nick and heads down to join the fray. So let's dig into Ultimate Power number 7 and see if this is an issue where things actually happen! Or if, like last time, we're going to be condensing a few more issues into one video. Reading from a tray to no looking at the cover, save to say that we have entered our final author of this miniseries, Jeff Loeb, who wrote Ultimatum and Ultimates 3. Batting 3 for 3 on crappy Ultimate Universe crossovers. Impressive! We open with a two-page spread where Doctor Doom and Iron Man are engaged in punching without actually hitting the other, while the Scarlet Witch lies on the ground, unconscious, in a pose that was probably stolen from porn. After all, what we really need to be focusing on in the middle of these two pages is her boobs. What's really amusing about this essentially just being multiple issues of fight scenes so far is that they're just such bad fight scenes. I've talked before about the deterioration of fight scene artwork over the years, but no one does it worse than Lance. Land. There's no flow to the fights at all. It's just people making big poses that might look good for a statue, but are awful for sequential art. It's just issue after issue of people going... On the helicarrier above, Spidey has shoved Nick Fury into some computer consoles to demand an explanation for Doctor Doom's presence, threatening to fill his lungs with webbing if he doesn't get an answer. What's Doc Doom doing here? Kicking some serious ass, as far as I can tell. Despite being panicky and worried about it last issue, I am suddenly elated that he's beating up my side. I'm such a great character in this. 
Spidey wants a proper explanation, and Fury is happy to provide it. After Reed's proposal to S.H.I.E.L.D. to send out the interdimensional probes was rejected, it turns out both Fury and Carol Danvers were aware that he'd send probes out anyway. Fury broke into the Baxter building that night before Reed sent them out, and had Doctor Doom reprogram the probes to relay information back to S.H.I.E.L.D. before it went to Reed. And again, as you can see from the backgrounds, he did it from the bridge of the Enterprise. Look, I don't like you being here. The instant you figure out warp drive technology, the Federation is doomed. Ha! Doom approves of the pun on his name! That was accidental. You presume that Doom cares! How he got in touch with Doom, especially given a revelation for Doom's presence here in the next issue, is not explained. But yeah, Fury says he doesn't like dealing with him any more than he liked dealing with Saddam Hussein back in the day. Yeah, but I don't think we had Saddam Hussein break into a high-tech research facility to gain access to sensitive information and tech just for the sake of having secrets. Although maybe we did, the US government does enough shady crap in its history for something like that. Like, I read through this book and back again to Ultimatum, and I'm struggling to find an actual motive for Nick Fury other than generic being secretive bullcrap. Like, if you wanted all this, why even be secretive at all? Why not work with Reed, limit how many probes he sends out, and insist you get to see all data first? Why work with Dr. Doom on this? Oh, because your scientists couldn't figure out the probes? Well, maybe if Reed was on board with you, you'd actually have some help. I mean, at least when Nick Fury in the MCU was being secretive and keeping things from the team in the first Avengers movie, his motives made sense. Superpowered beings come to Earth and they needed more advanced weaponry to counter them. And even then, he put more faith in the Avengers initiative to do that instead of bigger, stronger guns. It's just he was ordered to build the bigger, stronger guns by the shadowy council from XCOM. Here, his motives are just, this information could be dangerous. Better get a known supervillain to supposedly help us, even though he has more reason to just help himself. But yep, that's how things went down. He brought Doom to the Baxter building in the middle of the night while everyone was sleeping, had him reprogram the probes before Reed then sent them off without authorization, and then everything went down, like this image of Hyperion pointing at the reader. Reed Richards, does this bug you? I'm not touching you. That Hyperion dude and his merry band dropped by and kicked the crap out of us, all because of something they think Reed did, but really it was Doom? Spoilers for the next few pages, but... Nope! Doom's not even responsible for this either! It looks like Doom didn't even do anything to the probe beyond what he was contracted for! The main villain for your big crossover is, in fact, fairly inconsequential to the whole thing! Maybe because there were three writers on this story, they all gave, like, a third of the effort they normally bring! But yeah, next page we cut to the Pentagon, where Emil Burbank, the Supreme Power's version of Lex Luthor, has knocked Reed out with some gas as he gives his own exposition dump. Imagine living your whole life thinking the universe was one way. Then you find out what really goes into Arby's horsey sauce, and nothing makes sense anymore. Wasn't the world once believed to be flat? <laughs> once. <laughs> it's not. Funny, it's just really depressing. Or don't they have Columbus where you're from? I don't know, does your Earth have Aristophanes? Just seems like someone who's supposed to be so smart wouldn't be so dumb. I mean, a universe that doesn't have an email Burbank just chills me. A world without gloating speeches to unconscious people? Perish the thought! Yeah, he even admits that Reed is unconscious as he talks about all this, particularly how he was the smartest man on Earth, won a Nobel Prize, but then Hyperion showed up on their world and his Nobel Prize was a footnote on that day, realizing that superheroes were going to get more attention than him. Several months later, the government contacted Burbank and asked for a weapon to kill Hyperion if he got out of control. The biological mass that they blamed on Reed Richards' probe is that weapon. Oh, and the government also said it was okay with 10 million casualties worldwide, as long as it did the job of killing him. I'm the government. I'm the government. I'm the reason nothing works. Despite the fact that this was just supposed to be an option should they ever need it, they apparently decided to unleash it right then and there, using Reed Richards' probe as their scapegoat so no one knew it was them. So there you go! Doom is not responsible for this either! What was the point in including him if he's not gonna have any bearing on the plot? Reed is actually awake, having expanded his lungs so he can hold his breath longer, and he quickly grabs Emil and squeezes him like a stress ball, saying they're gonna find Hyperion and explain all this to him. 
Meanwhile, Thor forces the naked Hyperion down into the biomass and starts beating him up with his hammer. Characters continue punching each other, and back on the helicarrier, Spidey is berating Fury on what an idiotic plan recruiting Doom was. Pardon me for not being the super duper James Bondy that you are, Fury, but didn't anybody at spy school ever tell you, put the fox in charge of the hen house, all you get is chicken salad? Yes, but only because I took an elective in farm espionage. We took a chance, yeah. Yeah. A chance for what? Let's say this plan even worked. whoop de crap Now you know more about a parallel universe a slightly longer time than Reed Richards does. Congrats! It makes this whole thing worth it! Uh, not buying the extended warranty on your cell phone is taking a chance. What part about the name Doom in Doc Doom hasn't rung your bell? That is an odd way of phrasing that, Spidey. Shouldn't that be, raised your alarm bell? Ringing a bell is supposed to be a reminder, a sarcastic way of saying, hey, remember this? Look, Mr. Parker, I know you think that because I have one eye, I can't see, but I have been doing this job longer than you've been alive. I've been making stupid decisions since before you were born. And one of the things I've learned is, if you've got a fox in your chicken house, get a bigger dog. It'll kill the chickens much faster. And thus he reveals his secret weapon in this fight, the Hulk. You are just full of good decisions today, Nick. Speaking of bad ideas, Quicksilver finds the Scarlet Witch and wakes her up. He thinks that if she can concentrate all her power on defeating the Squadron Supreme, they can win this. Wanda, however, is reluctant. My power is unpredictable enough, but here, on whatever world this is in, whatever universe, I could end up making a sitcom starring me, and you could be played by someone else! He finally convinces her to try while the X-Men find Mr. Fantastic and email, freeing them. And so our comic ends with the results of Wanda's spell. Namely, that it somehow summoned the Squadron Supreme that the main Marvel Universe normally interacts with. And like the last time, this would actually make for a pretty short episode, so... Yeah, like before, we're gonna dig into issue 8 as well. God, with as little as happened in this thing to necessitate me doing this so many times, you'd think they'd have just stretched this out to a full 12 issues of nothing happening! And yes, issue 8 is another big, terrible, chaotic fight scene. Wolverine fights the Squadron Supreme Hyperion. What the hell are you made of? Righteousness. Oh, you're one of those people. I bet that you think we should be fighting supervillains instead of other heroes. Yeah, when I think about it, this is kind of a microcosm of so many of Marvel's events. Just have the heroes fight each other for a bunch of issues, stupid revelations, existing more to prop up future events that are just as bad, if not worse, and the conflict itself is either idiotic, or it can be resolved peacefully if the characters weren't acting idiotic. Reed ends up fighting the Squadron Supreme character Shape, who can stretch his body like putty. I don't understand. There are doppelgangers of you all? How can there be two versions of the same being occupying the same universe? Dude, you kept zombie versions of yourselves from another universe in the Baxter building for days or weeks. This is not new to you. So apparently, according to the Squadron Supreme, they got one of Reed's probes into their universe too and followed it here. But does that mean they have the weird biomass as well? And if that was happening in their own universe, what does that have to do with the Scarlet Witch apparently summoning them? The Whizzer, the Squadron Supreme speedster, realizes that something is wrong. Their powers are only half as effective, something that Hyperion of the Supreme Power Universe is experiencing as he wrestles Thor. Also, Iron Man and Doctor Doom are fighting, I guess, but again, Doom is barely a footnote in the story, despite how a big reveal he was supposed to be. I've claimed this Earth for myself, Stark! When you fall, it will follow! Not much of a plan, Doom, since I'm not going down. Doom's plan of taking over this planet by virtue of just being here is a great one, Stark! Doom is a magnificent bastard! He read Doom's book! Thor is pissed about how Hyperion is suddenly trying to de-escalate as he realizes something's wrong, but Zarda and Dr. Spectrum from Supreme Power calm him, pointing out that they could continue fighting indefinitely, but if there is someone else responsible for this mess, they should actually try to uncover it. Doom manages to finally knock out Iron Man, but the Thing punches him in yet another two-page spread. Oh yeah, this issue has a ton of unnecessary two-page spreads. Reed Richards would have a tough time stretching as much as this comic has for content! Just bear in mind, this shot of the Thing punching Doom 
That's past the halfway point of this issue! Anyway, Ben Grimm starts beating the snot out of Doom, only to rip Doom's arms off and reveal that he's actually been a Doom bot this whole time. I think this is supposed to imply that the real Doom was still behind this and just sent the Doom bot in his place, but again, for what reason? What was the plan? What was being accomplished by just sending a Doom bot to fight people? Ugh. Anyway, Hyperion finally got himself a change of clothes. The two squadrons, for some reason, are repeating each other as they fight their counterparts in yet another lazy spread to pad this crap out. We saw with House of M that Brian Michael Bendis loves to stretch things out and decompress for a ridiculous amount of issues, but we had J. Michael Straczynski and Jeff Loeb for the last few issues. Why is this book not over yet? Nighthawk from the Squadron Supreme spots Captain America, who he's met before in the regular Marvel Universe, but of course everyone is confused about what the hell this all means. Scarlet Witch says that she knew something terrible would happen if she used her magics here, something the two Arcanas repeat that she has much to answer for. Like, what beyond this single thing does she have to answer for? Back in the helicarrier, Spidey asks why the hell they're throwing the Hulk into what is already a cluster crap. Don't they teach you anything in high school? Hey, I go to public school. We're lucky to have books. The only books we have are ones that were banned by other schools. When two sides are too evenly matched, introduce a third element that will unite them all. Strategy 101. How about Idiocy 101, where the Hulk kills them all, or they defeat the Hulk, and then just go back to fighting each other anyway, or they don't unite to fight him because the situation is weird and complicated and nobody knows what's going on and just assumes he's yet another person on either player's side. What if he, you know, starts eating people? Seriously, what the hell was up with the Ultimate Universe and cannibalism? That's why you're going with him. Be his conscience, like Jimmy Cricket. It's Jiminy. Didn't they teach you anything in high school? I mean, with Disney acquiring everything else on the planet, I'm sure at some point they'll own schools that teach about the Disney canon. And so, Issue 8 ends with Spidey writing Ultimate Hulk down in yet another two-page spread like this was friggin' Doctor Strangelove. These comics suck! I'd move on to Issue 9 and end this whole thing right here, but frankly, I think I've had more than I want to at this point. And it's still lacking in content! What an enormous waste of time this series is! The artwork on these two issues is better, there's still plenty of tracing going on, but it hasn't been as extreme as other issues have been, with repeating the same faces multiple times in the same issue. Or at least I didn't notice it as much. But hey, maybe I didn't notice it because the writing is so asinine! Plot points that go nowhere, motivations and actions that don't make any sense, and stretching the plot out for so long that twice now I've had to cover two issues issues, just so it didn't feel like you guys weren't getting a super short video. And yet that's probably gonna happen when I get around to doing the final issue! Next time, back to Patreon-sponsored reviews. And back to Batman. Sort of. But more importantly, back to those Villain Month comics I've talked about a few times. And finally back to Batman the Dark Knight, that awful pointless book that originally gave us one face. The issue is not about one face, though it is about a face. I'm leaving now. Number 8, from Ultimate Power, number 7 to 8. You know, you already expect some poor quality work from a Greg Land-drawn comic when so much of it is just traced. Barely any work on his part as it is. But then there's something that you don't expect to be copied and pasted. Maybe it was him, maybe it was the letterer, maybe it was just an editor who wanted to shove the thing out the door and get it over with. But we have a case where writing was placed into the book. Oh, not any of the dialogue or caption balloons, no, no. Like I said, this may not have been Greg land's fault. Might have just been placeholder stuff meant to be filled in with something else later. But it seems that while the villainous Emil Burbank was expositing why he's actually Lex Luthor and is super jealous of Hyperion, the Superman XP, we have a flashback to a newspaper article about Hyperion that shoved Emil's Nobel Prize announcement down into more of a footnote. But then again, I don't know why he's so upset. It's not like anyone could read either article. 
because all of the text is lorem ipsum. For those who don't know, lorem ipsum is common placeholder text put into something to demonstrate formatting and layout of, say, a website or a magazine. Instead of using actual words, it's a bunch of corrupted Latin nonsense words and has been in use since the 1960s. And apparently this newspaper just printed it all like that. I mean, for crying out loud, there's even a magnifying glass into his little Nobel Prize announcement, and they couldn't be bothered to add a real sentence there for that. It didn't even need to be anything big and impressive, just like, Scientist Emil Burbank, known the world over for his achievements in science, was awarded the big science prize for his science. Like, I joke, but most of that wouldn't be visible in the magnifying glass portion, so it'd still work. But nope, just use common placeholder text. I can't really blame the paper for this, though. Because even the Nobel Prize email one is using it! Maybe I've got it all wrong. It is a parallel universe after all. Maybe in the Supreme Power Universe, the written language is so different that it actually just uses lorem ipsum. And what really counts is the order you put the words in to get meaning out of it. The smartest man in the universe. That's what Time Magazine called me three years running. Are you sure that's what they called you, Emil? Are you sure that they didn't just say you were lorem ipsum? Because that seems more in line with how things work here. Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Let's get 2022 off to a good start by finishing off Ultimate Power, which I started reviewing in 2015. And wow, looking back, that first episode was 27 minutes long. And not even storyline at the beginning or end of it. I actually managed to fill a good chunk of time just reviewing it. Mainly because I also covered two issues of it at once. And that's been the recurring theme of Ultimate Power, hasn't it? How little content there actually is in this stupid miniseries. Nine issues is a bit on the long side for a limited series, and usually means something epic in scope. Not as big as a full 12, of course, but it's really, really sad that with three or more issues than the average full miniseries, it feels like nothing has happened, that we're still stuck on the first or second plot point. Then again, it's probably hard to tell that anything has changed considering Greg Land is still repeating the same faces and poses. It's easy to believe we're frozen in time and not going anywhere. I think it's important to break down a little more why Greg Land's artwork is so frustrating and bad. It's not just that he traces. Tracing is a good tool for developing skills, and there are people who are able to recreate an image using a photo or the like for references. And arguably, tracing is what makes such cool artistic concepts like rotoscoping so awesome in many pieces of art. No, the problem is that he's so goddamn lazy about it. Instead of using a pose as a baseline, or having constant new photographs and models to draw, from, he just reuses the same things over and over and over and over. There's no originality to it, no craft in making that artwork unique in its own right and consistent across the characters' faces or poses for decent sequential storytelling. He was using the same reference pictures for years, might still be for all I know. The reason why people will overlay the same poses that he's happy to reuse, but for radically different characters, is to show that in terms of his artwork, Everyone is just a cookie cutter shape. See the same facial expression from six different people in the same comic. What makes these characters unique that differentiates one from another is absent. Everyone might as well just be a blank outline, because it doesn't matter with the way he traces. And it's made even worse in that in some cases, he doesn't even own the rights to the images he's traced. Again, it'd be different if he actually had models and photographs that he took and worked from, but nope. And then he goes into outright theft by stealing from other artists. It's still happening recently, too. In 2020, it was called out by Tristan Jones that artwork for Aliens that Land did for the Aliens Omnibus had a bunch of lifts from his own Aliens work. It's just incredibly scummy and lazy. I am baffled as to why he is still so frequently employed by Marvel. Just outright plagiarism. But hey, art is only half of why Ultimate Power is so bad. There's also its terrible writing from three normally much better writers who clearly were not giving it their all. So let's recap. 
Last time on Ultimate Power! Nick Fury revealed that he purposely tampered with Reed Richards' probes with the help of Doctor Doom so that information would be transmitted to S.H.I.E.L.D. first before going to the Baxter building. He had no reason to do this other than to be a villain in the story. Quicksilver convinced Scarlet Witch to try to use her powers to deal with the Supreme Power Squadron, but instead her chaos magic ended up summoning the Squadron Supreme that interacts with the main Marvel Universe, linked to the Supreme Power ones so that they're all talking in stereo! Fury, to compound his stupid evil plans, not only brought Doctor Doom along on this trip, but the Hulk as well, unleashing him upon all the heroes to force them all to join up against a common foe. Also, Doctor Doom was a Doombot this whole time, in an attempt to maintain continuity with other events in the Ultimate Universe that were going on at the time. Long story short, Doctor Doom was actually in the Zombie Universe, and the one running around in Ultimatum was actually Sue and Johnny Storm's mom, I guess. And then the Thing killed her in Ultimatum. The Ultimate Universe got really, really dumb the longer it lasted. So now we've got Spider-Man riding the Hulk down into the fray, his purpose to keep the Hulk from eating people because the Ultimate Universe's writers apparently thought cannibalism was the height of storytelling. Or maybe they liked how successful Marvel zombies had been and thought that the eating people thing was what the audience wanted. Let's dig into Ultimate Power number 9 and finally end this garbage! I know I shouldn't talk about the cover, what with this being a trade, but I do love how one of Land's generic woman smiling in an Herbal Essences commercial faces here looks like it's actually being noticed by the Scarlet Witch, who's all, The hell is your deal? We open with the Hulk attacking the Aquaman stand-in, the Amphibian, as well as Nighthawk. Hulk, put that man down! You don't know where he's been! Hulk squish fishies! No Hulk! Fish doesn't need to be tenderized! You're ruining the meat! Oh boy, gotta say, Fury's plan, as idiotic as it sounded, has them all fighting the Hulk instead of each other. Now if I can just keep Mr. Monster Face from eating them... <laughs> it's so funny that the Hulk is a cannibal in this universe. <laughs> How did the Ultimate Universe last for so long?! Quicksilver and the two squadron speedsters attempt to do a bunch of fast punches on him to no effect. The Skrullian Skymaster, who is apparently the Martian Manhunter equivalent in Squadron Supreme, contacts Quicksilver to rally the teams and devise a plan to take down the Hulk while the Scarlet Witch works with the two Arcanas to try to send the one team back to their own universe. Skrullian Skymaster shapeshifts into the Hulk to take him on in another unnecessary two-page spread. It's efficient. Land can just mirror the face he copies for the Hulk, and he has one less page he has to draw. Hulk beats him down until he reverts back to his default form. No, you don't look like Hulk! You look like dinner! Hulk really embrace raw food diet! And splash page for this. And in case you're wondering, yeah, there are quite a few more of them coming up. Hope you got your money's worth, audience. 90% of the issue is already just a fight scene, but it's not even a very interesting fight scene. The heroes are pouring it on as Hulk just banters, and I suddenly realized, is he just putting on an act? Because at the end of the last issue where they airdropped him, he seemed to be in his own right mind with the this ought to be good remark. But this entire fight, he's been all Hulk smash and whatnot. Anyway, Johnny Storm tries his fire on him. However, Hulk just uses his super breath to blow out the fire. And I guess knocks him unconscious, since in the next panel, Spidey is saving an unconscious Johnny Storm. Downside of raw food diet, Hulk's breath really bad. Hulk make a wish! I'm making one too. That this comic will be over soon. And I'm technically getting my wish. We're already halfway through it. All the heavy hitters, Thor, the Hyperions, and Storm, blast Hulk, and this is one of the better two-page spreads because of that, seeing just a massive outpouring of energy and lightning. But it also kind of works against it, since the heroes casting these attacks are tiny and unimpressive, and most of the shot is taken up by either Hulk's body or a lot of lightning effects. Just saying, you could have at least made Storm and Thor's lightning look different. Also, I guess I guess this comic is a turn-based RPG because characters keep launching attacks at him and then stopping so that someone else can have their go at it. Like that huge blast? 
Well, they need to rest off panel. Same for Dr. Spectrums and the Power Princesses. At least we saw Johnny Storm get knocked out. Well, actually we didn't, but we did see Hulk blow the flames back, so at least we have something of an idea of why he's not still attacking. And now it's the Thing's turn. This whole blasted thing started because of me. My pal Reed went looking for a cure to return me to my old bashful self. And I wound up messing with this whole friggin' planet. And yet you're barely a character in this story. Weird, isn't it? The least I could do is keep you from making it worse. Unfortunately, it turns out that beam he was using for a club was a load-bearing one for the Lincoln Memorial. Land really loves this one thing face where the guy looks like an open-mouthed bass at all times. You may think you're stronger than me, and maybe you are, but I got something you ain't never gonna have. Hot! Man, where's our Captain Planet reboot with Ben Grimm as Mati? Ha! Hulk eat things heart! You know, this whole situation could have been resolved in like a minute if any of you had packed some Hostess fruit pies. Anyway, Sue Storm tells Spidey to blind the Hulk. Who said that? Whoa! Hello, Betty! It's Sue. Sorry, it's just I've seen that face before on another woman during this story. Are you actually flirting with me? What? Who? Me? What? Dude, you spent this entire issue being worried about the Hulk eating people, and now when he's engaged in battle with someone that could very well end with that, you're catcalling the Invisible Woman. When she's not dressed any differently than any of the other women you've been on this trip with. INCLUDING YOUR GIRLFRIEND! Anyway, he uses his webbing to blind him, making this... sound effect. Sploosh. And Sue makes a force field around his head so that he can't breathe, allowing the Thing to finally knock him out. And the Hulk's just laying in the rubble with the Thing standing over him for another splash page. Followed immediately by a two-page spread of the Scarlet Witch returning the Squadrons Supreme to their respective universes. The Ultimates and Squadron Supreme agree to stop hitting each other, particularly when Spidey reveals to them that it was all Nick Fury's machinations. Fury brought in Doom. Who knows who else he dealt with? The Schemer? The Schemer? That's your go-to insult for him? Why stop there? Go for nefarious and dastardly while you're at it, dude. Oh, that Parker kid is dead. Did you think he wasn't going to tell them? Why? However, Kitty Pride remained on board per Peter's suggestion to keep an eye on Fury, and she, along with the Squadron Supreme member of the Shape, are quickly able to subdue him. Fury is brought down to the others, and he demands to be freed. Gentlemen, you're making an enormous mistake. You take me out of the equation, and you take away the safety valve. There are things. Secret things. Things you know nothing about. Do not do this. I've demonstrated multiple times now that I am untrustworthy and will happily contribute to the undoing of a world just to be super secretive and dangerous. You should totally take me at my word. The Ultimates surrender Fury to the Squadron Supreme, Reed Richards soon arriving with Emil Burbank to explain his part in all this. How he worked with Fury to set this up for reasons that I'm still not clear on. You can't do this to me. My planet needs me to protect it from all of you. I can best protect it by unleashing a biomass that kills millions. I'm the real good guy here, and I think I'm owed an apology. Written in lorem ipsum at that. Hyperion wants to know what assurances can be made that something like this won't happen again, and Power Princess volunteers to return to the Ultimate Universe to keep an eye on things. And we get a splash page of Hyperion and her making out, probably traced from porn. And if it wasn't, then what the hell was Hyperion doing lifting her leg like that? Later, at S.H.I.E.L.D. headquarters, Captain America wonders about the Scarlet Witch's powers. How she was able to pull an entire group of superpowered individuals from another universe. It's kinda hot. If she wasn't so into her brother, I'd take a swing at her. And then probably miss, cause I'm like three martinis to the wind at this point. You're such a jackass. Yeah, I know. I mean, pretty much everyone here is. You just kinda get used to it. Back over to the Fantastic Four, we learn that the event that incited this whole story, the Thing losing a chunk of his orange rock skin, no longer matters, as the area that was chipped off is now growing back. Reed once again promises Ben that they'll find a way to fix him, and so our comic ends with the Thing telling him to not make that promise, since the last time that he did so, he screwed this all up and almost destroyed a world. And he silently cries as he looks at a photo of himself and Reed from before he was changed. Wow. 
a sad moment and a reminder of the tragedy that is the thing. It's a pity that it has nothing to do with anything in this story. This comic sucks! God, what an enormous waste of time this miniseries was. Like, the only real narrative purpose I can think of is to take Nick Fury out of the action for Ultimatum, but there was really no need to do so anyway, because they just went and got him for the conclusion. And despite this whole thing starting because of the desire to help Ben Grimm, it's left completely unresolved. Like I just said, it has nothing to do with anything. It doesn't motivate any of Reed's actions in the Supreme Power universe, few as those may be anyway. There's nothing about the thing's condition that contributes to the resolution, unless his I have a heart thing was meant to be him mostly accepting of his fate, which is then undone by the very last shot of the comic. And even then, I don't recall if he really did anything in any of the other issues leading into this. He's there for the start, he's there for the finale, but everything in between? Psh, it's everyone else's story. I don't even know if anybody was even really demanding this crossover. Sure, the original Squadron Supreme frequently interacted with the regular Marvel, Marvel Universe, but did anyone want the darker take of them to meet the Ultimate Universe? I looked up the review quote on the back of the tray to see if it was one of those cases where it was taken out of context, but nope, it was from a genuinely positive review of issue 4, which they then described as fun. Fair enough to people who did enjoy it. You're allowed to have your own opinions, but I am just baffled how this could be considered fun. The characters are annoying, the artwork is quite literally repetitive, and especially when it comes to this issue, lazier than normal since Land didn't even bother to draw backgrounds! Why not just swipe some more shots from Star Trek like he did before? Plenty of matte paintings he could trace. And in the end, the story is just so utterly pointless and lifeless. Nothing is achieved. No lessons are learned. It's just nine issues of badly drawn fight scenes, and some tiny bits of pathos here and there. It is utterly lacking in substance, to the point where even the newspapers have placeholder text in them. We hope you've enjoyed No Moral Theater, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Next time, we've got our first Patreon-sponsored episode of the year, as we look at a few episodes from the Superboy live-action series. Gotta be better than this! Oh, and the cover is a complete lie, and you could have swapped it out with the previous issue's cover, since there's no fighting between the groups in this issue. There are some things you never see more than once in your lifetime. Unlike Greg Land's artwork, wherein we see the same faces and poses ad nauseum. Hello my friends, please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell for notifications on new video releases. If you'd like to support future videos, you can check out my Patreon or purchase a t-shirt via Teespring or Shark Robot. Thanks for watching!